Hi, I'm Eric Mazumpaka, and welcome to Stun Archives. In today's episode, we introduce you to a true legend in the stunt industry. Her journey in the world of stunts began with determination and a passion that led her to work alongside of some of Hollywood's biggest names. From early days on film sets in Vancouver, the story is nothing short of awe-inspiring. Join us as we explore her 30-year career filled with epic stunts, famous collaborators, and groundbreaking achievements. Please welcome Melissa Stubbs. Fresh. I'm Melissa Stubbs, and this is Stunt Archives. Melissa Stubbs, how are you doing today? Melissa Stubbs is great today. Nice. How are you, Eric? I am fantastic. Thank you for um, letting me be a part of this. Yeah. There's a lot of cool legends that I'm sure you've interviewed that I can't believe I get to be in the same company. From doing my research, you've like more than earned it. So growing up and watching shows like Charlie's Angels and The Bionic Woman, how did these strong female leads influence your decision to pursue a career in stunts? I think it looked really fun and those strong female roles, they just, you know, women to look up to, they seem really cool and strong and like somebody I might want to be when I grew up. So I wasn't interested in the pesky dialogue as I like to call it. The physical aspect of it looked fun. I wanted to ride horses and my poor father, like whatever, all the family vacations, I was like, look, dune buggies, look, they have horses, look, bumper cars, go-karts, like my poor father, let's go surfing. You know, as a kid, it just seemed like a natural progression for me. And I never thought I'd actually be working on movies. Like it was such a foreign thing growing up in Vancouver. That was like something they did in that distant place called Hollywood. And the industry came to us. If, it, if they hadn't made films and whatnot here, I probably would have go. Ch I would have chased it and found myself. And I remember going to see a live stunt show at Universal Studios. My dad would take me to those. And um, actually, the first one I ever saw, I was probably seven. We were up in Williams Lake at Barkerville days. They had like a Wild West town, and there was a man doing a whip and a whip show and gun spinning. And he was shooting apples off of people's heads and whip. And I was fascinated. That was the coolest thing ever. And then years later, I came to find it was Alex Green. And my soccer coach knew Alex and introduced me at a young age to Alex. I went to a studio and I went, oh my God, I remember you when I was seven. I went to your live Wild West show. And, um, and then Alex and I, you know, he was one of my mentors and we became great friends. And so that was one of the first live stunt shows I ever saw was the great legend Alex Green. He just had this childlike zest for life and stunts. He just had this wonderment and curiosity like a child would for movies. And, you know, he really thought he was Zorro. You know, when he got to do Zorro, it was like all of his wild childhood dreams came true of, you know, pretending as a child and now he's Zorro standing on the roof cracking the whip. And um, he just never lost that passion for it, right, like up until when he passed. It was like inspiring. How did Glenn Randall Jr. taking you under his wing as a stunt coordinator for Time Cop impact your career trajectory and confidence in the industry? Oh my gosh, that was a huge shift. I walked into his office unsolicited. I heard there was a movie being shot in town with Jean-Claude Van Damme. And there was a stunt coordinator, second unit director, and he was directing the second unit and stunt coordinating Time Cop. And I just walked into his office one day and said, hey, I'm Melissa. I have some stunt equipment. I had bought an airbag from a, a, a fire department in Colorado. So stunt equipment is when a stunt coordinator came to Vancouver, they didn't bring all their gear with them, so they would need to source gear locally. Yeah. So I said, hey, I've got stunt pads. I've got a ratchet. We have air rams. These are all mechanical pieces of equipment that we use to augment action and create explosions and superhero stuff. And I had an airbag and I said, I have all this equipment. If you need it, I'd love to come and work with you. And he was like, hmm, for sure. Like, give me your name and number and I'll keep you in my book. And he goes, actually, you might be a good double for my leading lady. And I was just blown away. And he said, I need a Canadian stunt coordinator. Can you recommend? some names and I was like well there's Tony Morelli there's Jacob Rupp I've heard of those guys you know I'm kind of thinking somebody younger and up and coming because he wanted to groom somebody new who was fresh who didn't 
have old ideas or he wanted uh, a fresh, somebody with fresh eyes. And I go, well, there's an up and coming guy who's a very good stuntman, his name's Jim Dunn. And he's been coordinating but here and there. He's my training partner. And he's a smart guy and he's done everything. He, he might be the right fit for you. And also Mike Mitchell, who was my business partner at the time, he's also a phenomenal athlete and stunt guy and who won him on the show with you. And so I recommended Jim Dunn the next day. He called him and he had the job as the stunt coordinator for Glenn. And I was gonna double the leading lady and we were in rehearsal process and Jim Dunn and I went, and Mitch, I think, went motocrossing. Jim had an accident, impaled himself with a branch on a tree and he was in the hospital. So I called Glenn, this is before email and cell phones and all that sort of thing, about 1992 or three. And um, so I went to see Glenn. I'm like, hey, Jim has had an accident. And I think we were starting to shoot the next day. And I'm like, you, your stunt coordinator is in the hospital. And I went to the Jim's house, got all his books, because we didn't have computers at those times. Kept everything in a book, in a binder. Everybody's resumes and headshots for all, who was gonna play what role, who was gonna double who, and the schedules and everything. So I took it to Glenn to his hotel and said, here's all he and all of Jim's stuff. So he's your stunt guys, who's your, you know, I have everybody's contact. And he said, well, I guess you're my new stunt coordinator. Wow. I was 23 years old. Wow. And I was like, oh, no, 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 no. And I had done one day as a stunt coordinator on a movie in Skagway, Alaska. Jacob Rupp had recommended me. Jacob couldn't go. Yeah. So he recommended I go up there. I would double Doogie Howser. That was Neil Patrick Harris nice. driving a car. And I was a stunt coordinator. And I was a prosthetic frozen, frozen foot. Yeah. So <laughs> multi-purpose person. Yeah. So I'd done one credit as a stunt coordinator that Jacob had kindly mm. recommended me for. Yeah. And so Glenn said, you're my new stunt coordinator. And I know you coordinated that show up in Alaska. I go, oh, no, 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 it was like one day. I was there for a week waiting for one day. I'm, I just want to be, I just wanted to do the stunts. I wanted to roll the cars. I wanted to go off the roof. I wanted to learn. I had this thirst to learn. I, I'm like, I have no desire to be a stunt coordinator. Glenn said, well, you've coordinated when you're ready. And I'm like, I am not ready, man. I want a stunt rig and I want to do stunts. And I want to be a stunt coordinator. He goes, well, you'll be just fine. I'm going to direct second unit and you're gonna be the stunt coordinator. And so he really threw me in the deep end at a young age, not really ready, um, but I just took the, he gave me the ball, so I ran with it. You know, I was a little intimidated by the, because the industry was very tight knit. Stunts Canada sort of ran the world here and I was not yet in Stunts Canada. And I was so worried about stepping on toes or biting off more than I could chew yeah. because it was one show, but. You don't want to piss off the community. You want to be respectful and wait your turn. Yeah. I said, well, what about Jacob Rupp? What about Tony Morelli? What about Ken Kirchinger? You know, all of the, and he's like, I want you. So I took the ball and I ran with it. And it was very intimidating. Uh, Glenn was the biggest deal in the world, stunt coordinator at the time, him and yeah. Conrad Palmisano and maybe Charlie Paterni and Terry Leonard, those sort of people. So it was a, a big deal to be thrown into that, you know, also doing stunts, um, doubling the leading lady. So it, it completely changed the trajectory of my career immediately overnight. It was film school for me. Yeah. And uh, I learned a lot and was thrown in some pretty hairy situations to stand up against Peter Himes, the director, who was very tough, and tell Jean-Claude Van Damme that his kick didn't look good or it was not a sell. And he was a big deal in the world. He was the biggest action hero, up and coming guy at the time, yeah. besides Arnold Schwarzenegger. Yeah. And I was like, and he'd be, what do you mean my kick doesn't work? <laughs> shall, I, shall I touch him? And he, was, he was kicking Brad Lurie in the face. And I said, well, if you feel like you need to hit him, but, or you could just shift your weight to the left and look at, and make the kick work. Yeah. So it was a little intimidating, but I didn't I stand my ground and kept eye contact and didn't back down. Because I was just, you know, 23 year old, silly little girl to him yeah, yeah. but I earned his respect with time by not having an ego and just coming into it and Glenn uh, and Glenn hired me on a few more shows after that he doubled Jeopardy I was doubling Ashley Judd and I was his stunt coordinator and then further jobs would come up with Brian Smurs or Jeff Haberstadt on Mission to Mars and Glenn recommended me to them 
as the stunt coordinator because I didn't try to run things. Mm -hmm. I kind of said, hey, it's your show. You're, you're the ultimate big boss. How can I help you? Yeah. What can I learn from you? And that's how I approached it. And when they wanted to bring up all their people, their brother-in-laws and their sister-in-laws or their girlfriend from the States to come and do, take all the stunt work, I understand they wanted people they were comfortable with, yeah. but I would be, you know, why don't you just meet so-and-so? They're pretty skilled. Why don't you just, if you don't like them or this person or that person, then bring up your buddy. Yeah. And I sort of approached it that way. And I did my best to find the right talent and the right people, because if, that person that I recommended didn't deliver, my word meant nothing. But they'd be pleasantly surprised. Yeah. You know, the locals had so much talent and no ego. Here's the thing, like, yeah. I didn't have a ton of skill. I was just really tough and passionate. I wasn't a great gymnast. I wasn't really great at anything except I was tough. I was a tomboy. I could, they give me five minutes, I can learn anything quickly. But I did not come into this knowing how to fight or knowing how to do a backflip or a back handspring. You know, I learned from, you know, Mike Mitchell, Laura Chartran taught me how to, my original martial arts teacher, and I learned to film fight. And um, I had an athletic, athleticism, but I have found, and I'm dyslexic, so I found that I had to outwork everybody. I had to train my ass off to learn. I had to earn every bit of it. I just applied myself and had, you know, I would do three disciplines, work out in the morning, you know, and I would go snowboarding or I would go skydiving or I would go ride horses. So I try to do three disciplines a day. So I was always doing something. I could not sit still and I couldn't stand that. For instance, on a show called Broken Badges, Gary Combs had me doubling the leading lady. Gary Combs and Conrad Palmisano were sort of the grandfathers, you know, the godfathers of stunts in Vancouver. They pretty much like started the guys in Stunts Canada because they worked with them, learned from them, and they were empowered by Palmisano and Gary Combs and given made stunt coordinators. So nothing but res like an ultimate respect for Gary Combs. He lost his eye in Little Big Man. He got hit with an arrow. He only had one eye, but he could still drive and still had depth perception. So Gary's, I, I said, I said, Gary, there's a motorcycle sequence up. Well, sir, will I be doing that? And he, he just laughed. I said, kid, I know you're good, but maybe next time I'm going to bring up Debbie Evans. She's the best female motorcyclist in the business. And I went, and I remember I was gutted, gutted. And I watched Debbie ride, I watched her demeanor, and I, I quickly understood why Gary didn't let me do it. I wasn't ready. Uh, and Debbie Evans was, blew me out of the water. But that was a good thing in the end. It lit a fire under my ass going, I'm never going to be replaced again. I'm going to be, I've got to be ready. I have to be good at everything. And then I can't be ignored. You know, if I'm not, Choose, chosen to do the car stunts, then I'm going to go to every rally school and every race school and every stunt driving school I can until somebody does give me an opportunity. Being one of the first successful female stunt coordinators and second unit directors, what were some of the most significant obstacles you had to overcome to reach this milestone? There were no female stunt coordinators or second unit directors. There just weren't any and I couldn't figure out. All my mentors were old white guys who'd been in the business for a thousand years. And they were the second year directors. And I never thought in my wildest dreams that I would, little Melissa Stubbs from, grew up in West Vancouver, originally from England, would ever be given an opportunity. I had nobody, no family in the business. So I just put my eyes on the prize. I'm going to be the first female second year director in Canada. Now, Betty Thomas was stunt coordinating, the wife of John Thomas, special effects, which she was stunt coordinating. And I think she ended up directing a few days on Once a Thief for John Woo. And it probably would have been easier for me to just, you know, um, become a director, go straight to directing. It would probably be an easier path, but I was like, nope, going to be an action unit director. And so I followed that. And as a female, a young female, because I started in the industry quite young, probably 18-ish, and I was coordinating by 23. All these opportunities were coming to me and I, Tried to handle it as best I could, um, but I never, I didn't sleep, or never stopped working. Yeah. And I was, I would get interviewed for a show and I would go in to meet these big wig producers, directors, 
And they would always do the three, the magic three. They were bringing three people to interview. And it always be like Ken Kersinger or Mark Akerstream or Jacob Rupp or Betty Thomas. And, and I would go, and it was rare for a female to get a job. They'd go, oh, you're a girl. I'm like, yes, Melissa generally re reflects a female name, but... And then I've never had a female stunt coordinator. I'm like, well, you're in for a treat because we're better. <laughs> and, and I said that with, without ego, just earnestly. I said, yeah. no, you're, you know, I look at things differently and not from the ego. I look at things from the character and the story and much more emotional and, you know, emotionally more evolved, I guess, yeah. you know, intellectually. And anyways, um, so it was, it was a huge, I had to work harder and be more prepared than the guys. Because yeah. let's just six foot tall David Jaycox or Danny Virtue or Ken Kershner walks on a set. They command respect immediately. They look like the quarterback. And there's, you know, little five, five stubs who's, you know, young female coming in here telling people what to do and in charge of everyone's safety. And, you know, thousands or millions of dollars, at, in some cases on bigger films, it's a pretty big, you know, crown that you have to wear, a lot of responsibility, convincing, you know, the studio safety people that you know what you're doing. And bring in good people that probably knew more than me. And if you don't know something, it's okay. You, you, there's a, I have a million older brothers I could call and say, hey, how would you approach this? Yeah. You know, I've got to do this and this. And they'd be like, well, I would do that and that and that. So... I had a lot of support also, but it was very intimidating. I didn't know how I was going to do it. I just knew I was going to do it. And I was like martial arts, uh, the respect, I was ready to wait my turn. What makes the BC stunt community special? We have an amazing community here. And, but sometimes you have to leave it to realize what you had. So I wanted to do all that and discover the world so that I could come back here and work with my brothers and sisters that I grew up with and give them work to say thank you. <laughs> so yeah, the community here is very tightly knit and very supportive. It wasn't like that in the rest of the world. It was, there was a lot of, they don't have the camaraderie that we had here. Your work spans across a wide range of film and TV series, from Terminator Genesis to Fifty Shades of Grey. How do you approach designing and shooting action sequences that fit different genres of storytelling styles? I take every script and approach it differently. And I always try to talk directors or producers out of action because A, they don't have the money to do it or the time, or I think it's just doesn't really fit the story. Like why, why are you blowing this car up? What, we don't need another fight here. We've already had three fights, this is redundant. Yeah. So I treat it like a filmmaker, like a director, not as a stunt coordinator who wants to hire all my friends and do big stunts and wreck things, which is, that's great. Like, oh, we do this cool stunt. And like, does it really fit in the movie or the show? Does it really suit the character? Do we really need it? Because I've seen so many times all these crazy stunts and we do eight, seven, eight, nine, ten takes and I am wrecked at the end of the day. And it's not in the movie. Never yeah. ends up in the movie. So, and I know this and I look at cameras and I look at and I go, that shot's never going to use that. And I know. So I'll do three takes and be like, do we really need another one? Cause I'm, you know, I, I never want to say no. I learned from all that stuff getting thrown on the floor. It never ends up in the movie. It's just a waste of time. And it's just a big ego because some producer wants to do a lot of action. So I often try to talk them out of it. Uh, and, and I will read the script. I will read the story arc. I will put myself in the head of all the characters and go from there and go, what would this character do in this moment? We didn't have pre before, so we would basically rarely rehearse anything. We would just shoot it on the day, which was a lot of the way things went, is yeah. just shoot it on the day with very little rehearsal. And definitely there was no pre -vis. You know, I remember X-Men 2 was the first time I really, we followed an animatic that the visual effects department had created for the Nightcrawler White House sequence. Brian Smurs showed me on his computer. He was the second year director. Here's the animatic. This is what we're doing. So we were paint by numbers. So yeah. I'm like, this previous thing is amazing. So it was, it's evolved and changed everything, you know, how we do it today. Can you describe a particularly daring or intense stunt you performed that pushed your limits and led to a breakthrough moment in your career? 
You know, there's been many things where you didn't think it was going to go wrong and it went wrong. You end up upside down in a river with J.J. McCarroll. I learned a lot of what not to do. A very important lesson is when there are accidents or people screw up, find out everything you can about the situation. Not to point blame or to find out who screwed up, but how do we prevent it in the future? So I ask a lot of questions. Well, what speed were you going? What were you thinking? What have? What were you doing the night before? Like, what shoes were you wearing? Who said what at the last second? What was the miscommunication? There's been a lot of those defining things that changed my career or I learned valuable lessons from. I remember on Rumble in the Bronx, Jackie Chan and his team asked for some silly things for me to do on the motorcycle. It was raining, the cars were slippery, and we had knobby tires and motorcycles. Like, can you jump off the top of this van? And I was like, no, I'm gonna crash, I'm gonna end up. And I was working day shifts on a commercial and working nights on it, so I was exhausted and cranky. So I'd be like, no, that's gonna be a wreck. And so I would, I remember leaving the set, and coming back, and they had poor Kathy Hubble up there on the top of the car, and I'm like, what are you guys doing? And she came off there and ran right in her head. She was a very thick-necked, strong one. I would snap my neck. And then they did it. I'm like, you need traction up there, guys. So they <laughs> nailed wooden slats on the roof of the car. And I'm like, Kathy, you get on the throttle, blip, blip the clutch at the end. She got so hard on the throttle, the wooden slats went duh, 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 out the back tire. And she wheelied off the top of this car and slammed it on post and broke her femur. And I'm like, that's what I said. And uh, so some things like that. But another one I remember, Fred Perrin and I were going to jump a snowmobile off a cliff. And the snow uh, in the afternoon was fluffy and light, but it would freeze at night and it was like rock hard in the morning. So we didn't know, like if you land in nice fluffy powder off a 30 foot cliff, you're golden on a downhill. It was, but I was on the back. So that is the worst position for someone who knows how to ride snowmobiles or motorcycle. It's the, like, the scariest part. Most guys won't do it, get on the back with a, a, a girl riding the motorcycle. So I'm on the back with Fred, so my life is in his hands. So I got on his back like a koala bear, and we jumped off this cliff. And I thought, pretty sure we're going to auger in and hurt ourselves very badly. I didn't think we were going to die, but it's going to be a wreck. And I knew it. And uh, I was, but we did it anyway. Like, I'm like, there's a small chance it's gonna be okay. And Fred Perrin was, at the time, he was a wing nut. Like he always went, he's a great stunt performer, don't get me wrong, but he was a ballsy go for it guy. And I had, a, I was his backpack. And we went off the cliff and I was like, this is it. And we just went, poof, landed like butter. And it was like, I thought for sure I was gonna break my legs and my spine. And so there's just like moments where that, like that, where you learn along the way, calculated risk, when, when to take a chance and when not to. You just kind of know. Another one was um, Suicide Squad. I remember uh, they needed a double for Margot Robbie, and a great like physical double for her, same size and whatnot. Mm -hmm. She wasn't wearing a helmet. And it was, they wanted, they wanted me to lay down a motorcycle. So they flew me out to Toronto. Like, you want to rehearse laying down Harley Davidson? I'm like, I could lay it down all day, okay. So I went out there, laid it down. I'm like, great, there's your wrecked bike, now what? I'm like, this is, she's supposed to be cool. She's supposed to be getting the attention of the Joker. Like, she's in love with this guy. Yeah. Took it from a character story point. She's in love with the Joker. She's his therapist. She's going to want to get his attention, not just crash a bike. What's sexy about that? What if she, like, lays the bike down? beside the car, takes a sexy look at him, and then gets up on the bike and surfs it in front of his car and steps off and steps, stops his car. That would be cool. And they're like, that's awesome. You think you can do it? And I'm like, I don't know. I've never tried to surf the bike when I'm, I've laid down lots of bikes, yeah. but it's a different story surfing the bike. So I got myself into trouble and they're like, okay, hey, now we're going to do this. So we, we, Pat Mark rehearsed it a bunch because I, had gone home at this time and he got it dialed in. And then they brought me in the night before, the day before, and then I had to, Pat Mark is far beyond a thousand times more skill on a motorcycle as I have. Yeah. And like, well, Pat could do it. I'm like, well, great. So, but it took all my, um, a bunch of skills of coming up with the gag that you'd never seen before. And it was kind of fit in the story and it was kind of a cool moment for the character. 
and taking my surfing and snowboarding and you know I used competitive skateboarder as a kid and into motorcycles and and balance and all those different skills that you've acquired over the years all into one thing and without a helmet and with short sleeves and in the cold and freezing at night in Toronto and take 13 it worked so I was like so scared that I was going to fail but we nailed it it worked they were stoked but you know what it never ended up in the movie <laughs> it's in the extras it on the DVD but you know lesson learned never I you know tried to kill myself to, to, to do it it was a cool gag because it took like a bunch of different skills to, to do it and somehow we muddled through and uh, it worked. Can you tell us about the motorcycle gag you did with Scott Nicholson uh, jumping an airplane? We had a gag where we had to jump an airplane and Scott didn't think he could do it and I'm on the back with the guy who thinks he can't do it. He goes, how am I gonna jump this? He's a great motorcyclist and a very good stuntman. Yeah. And he's ballsy. Um, and he had talked himself out of it, so he didn't think he could do it. Like, how am I gonna do it with you on the back? I'm like, dude, you're gonna be fine. I'm on the back, and I know you could do it. I totally knew he could do it. You know, I'm the one that's gonna get wrecked, because yeah. he's gonna hang on, he's gonna be just fine. Yeah. I'm on the back of the motorcycle jumping over the airplane, and it's a really bad position to be in. But I had done it, I had jumped motorcycles a ton, and I also had done the day in the dirt, um, where you do a pairs race. So it's a team race where you yeah. tag team off, and the last lap you have to do doubled up. So you're doing tabletops, you're doing doubles and triples on the back, two people riding. Sometimes you get to ride, sometimes you're on the back, and you trade off. So I'd done it before on a moto track, and I'm like, oh, we got this. I'm gonna be one with you, Scott. So I just, you know, I had my own pegs on the back and I just became a backpack. Like, he didn't even know I was there. And I'm like, you just go for it. And I was singing to him the whole way. I was singing some silly little song. I'm like, you got this! And he was so mad at, because he didn't want to try it, but he nailed it. Like, and we did it like seven takes. And then I had to go tell Mike Mitchell, the director, I said, we're done. You've got the shot. Do you have the shot? He said, yeah, but I want to. No. No, we're done, buddy. So I had the confidence to say, don't push your luck. And uh, so it was an interesting one for sure. There are very few cooler ways to go to Cannes. In the film festival? Yeah, and to the film festival. In a sequin gown. In a sequin gown on a dirt bike. Yeah, with high heels. David Jacobs and I found ourselves in Cannes at the Cannes Film Festival. Yeah. Um, and I got us tickets to the big red carpet event to It's a Beautiful Life which won the Oscar that year for best, not best foreign film, best film. And we went to dinner at the Carlton. David was in some sort of a tuxedo-ish type, David version of a tux. And I was wearing a dress, which is not really, I don't like wearing dresses, but you have to wear these things to these red carpet big events. And we had dinner and you can't move 10 feet at the Cannes Film Festival. So you can't get a car in anywhere and then you can't, I can't walk in heels. So we decided to rent a dual purpose bike, dirt bike, from, it was cheap. It was a good way to get it. We didn't want a Vespa, we wanted a dirt bike. And I hate going on the back of the bike, but you know, guys don't want the girl riding the motorcycle. So you kind of got to go, okay, fine. I will go on the back. Yeah. You just, and it was cool. So Dave and I had a lovely dinner at the Carlton and we went to the Cons Film Festival and we were riding up, like we hopped the little fence to get out of the restaurant, rode along the sidewalks in between the cars you know, we were two, and I'm dressed in a gown, Amazing. and David's in some kind of a tuxedo, and we like rip, pull up to the, slide up to the uh, event, the red carpet, and just ditched the bike, and like walked into the red carpet event and attended. It's a beautiful life. It's the best way to get around cons on a motorcycle if you know how to ride them. Joining the Directors Guild of America and being invited to join AMPAS, the Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Science, how do you feel these milestones have contributed to the recognition and representation of women in the film industry? At the time when Canadians went down to the United States, we were frowned upon. They didn't want any Canadians because all the movies in the U.S. market, they felt they were all leaving and going to Canada, so they didn't like when Canadians went there. But I just sort of like was patient and proved myself and 
was given an opportunity. I was the stunt coordinator on a film. Conrad Palmisano was the second year director. He had the schedule went over. We were shooting in New York, and I had written a, a sequence for the director of a bicycle, two people on a bicycle, a bike courier, and a girl trying to get somewhere in a hurry, kind of taking that whole probably the Cannes Film Festival. How do we get to the movie in time when it's an hour traffic line? Yeah. You get on a motorcycle or a bicycle and you do a two up. I'm like, how about the bike courier puts her on the back and rides over top of the cars? Because I knew we could ride over top of cars learning from Rumble in the Bronx, riding motorcycles over top of cars. What if we're in gridlock in Manhattan and they have to ride the bicycle over cars? So I had written it. And Connie Palmzano said, I've got to leave for this other movie. He said, Let, why don't you let Melissa direct it? So he, he spoke up for me for the studio and the director and the producers. And they were like, yeah, she wrote it anyway. So I got to direct three days of second unit. It was in 2003. And I got in the DGA. And they closed off Fifth Avenue in Manhattan. And I'm like, I better not screw this up. It was a big deal, a lot of money, a lot of time, and something I'd written. And I had to make it work, you know, get the, make sure the bicycle sequence is in. And the sequence was shot properly. It's amazing what you can absorb and learn over the years and realize what you have learned. And you have all this knowledge and you say things that come out of your mouth. I'm like, where did, who said that? Yeah. <laughs> where did I get that from? Yeah, yeah. But you absorb it along the way somehow through osmosis or just being the fly on the wall yeah. and have tried these different experiences in your life that all come to one place. And it got me in the DGA, it got my Director's Guild of America card, which led to, there was no female stunt coordinators in the academy. And um, again, Glenn Randall Jr., Conrad Palmisano, you have to have 100% vote in. And I was working with Steven Spielberg and Kathleen Kennedy at the time on Indiana Jones. We had just finished. So I called up Steven's assistant and said, hey, would Steven sign my paper for the Academy membership? There were no women in my field. There was only, at the time, 10 male stunt coordinators, old white guys in the academy at the time, five or 10. So I put in my little application and Stephen, assistant called me right back because I got Stephen on the line here. He said he's already signed for somebody this year because you could only do one person per year, but Kathleen will do it for you. Stephen, he said he'd be delighted to do it. I, he'll do it for me next year, even though I'm not with DreamWorks, but Kathleen hasn't supported anybody this year. She'll do it for you. So Kathleen Kennedy, I didn't know, was the pr vice president of the academy that at the time, yeah. I didn't know. So I got in from her name on my sheet and Connie Palmisano was my secondary. And they voted on it and I was brought in. Nowadays, to get into the academy, they've lowered the criteria. You don't longer need 10 credits. I just wanted to get the screeners and the invites to the movies, you know. But so being in the academy was kind of, it, it doesn't help your career any. But it kind of legit, you get to go to the Academy Awards and you get to, I'm a, I, you know, I'm a huge film fan and not just stunts, but all of it. So it was a, a pretty cool thing for me to be able to take my mother to the Academy Awards and sit with all these, these people, you know, and it was a pretty cool thing. Have you ever had to modify a stunt or action sequence due to an injury? Uh, yes, because I was usually always injured. <laughs> If I wasn't working, I was training, and I used to overtrain. Yeah. So I was tweaking ankles, I was, or I broke my collarbone because I was motocrossing, trying to keep up with Jaycox. It's like being an NFL football player. You play hurt all the time, and you have to tape things, and you, ch you change the gag, you're like, hey, why don't we do this? And yeah, there's been some instances where, okay, my left shoulder is screwed, so I can only go on my right side where you have to like adapt and change things or like, hey, what is it the actress do today? <laughs> I've had to do that before because, you know, um, I've been tweaked many times. It's like in this game, if you're not hurt, you weren't trying hard enough and you were being too safe. Yeah. It's, it's like a pro athlete, you're gonna get hurt. So yeah, I can't remember one in particular, but there's been definite times where I've like said to the director, why doesn't the actress or actor do it? Injuries are an unfortunate reality in your line of work. Can you talk about the most challenging injury you've experienced and how it impacted your perspective on stunt work? Yes, I've had a few. I think I've broken almost every bone in my body. You know, my 
broken my legs three times. So my right, my left, my right, and it was all like a six month healing process. But when I was younger, I pretty much thought I was invincible. I didn't think I could get hurt. I had zero fear and I was never gonna get hurt. And we did a thing, a chuck wagon, runaway chuck wagon sequence. We had a blind driver underneath, Fred Perrin. Jim Dunn was riding shotgun. We were in an old Western buckboard wagon, runaway wagon down a ski run at Whistler in the summer. So it was just rocky. And it was a very poorly built wagon and the wheel broke because we we're going too fast. And I went to go push off high side. Jim was locked in and wasn't going anywhere. So I'm like, I got nowhere to go. Oh. <laughs> 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 yeah. Um, on a runaway stagecoach, yeah. going too fast, um, poorly built um, wagon. It was a lower budget show and the special effects team built this wagon and the wheel broke. So I didn't know where to go. I knew how to get off and I'm wearing a skirt and little like Ked running shoes, like not proper footwear. And so uh, I got pitched into a gully where there's just rocks and whatnot. And my foot got stuck between two rocks and I rolled and I got up and I went to get up and my toes were pointing that way and there's a bone sticking out and I, I was like, I looked at it and I was like, whose leg is that? Because it was no longer part of my body. And I'm like, well, that's screwy. Thankfully, I was still fairly young and I was finally, I got hurt like bad, like career ending bad. And I was like, you know what? Screw this. I'm going to come back better, faster, stronger. And because it was all taken away and I was, I didn't, I wanted to go for a run. I wanted to be able to do stunts until I'm 80. Yeah. And um, so the doctor told me I'd likely never run. And I think six months to the day, I ran by that surgeon on the seawall and said, you're a better surgeon than you thought. And it made me, it really humbled me and it made me appreciate everything that I had and this, this job, this industry, this career, and they could all be taken away in a moment uh, from just, and it wasn't really, it wasn't my fault. I was just stuck in a bad wagon and, you know, going too fast. So that was one of the changed the trajectory of my career. Can you tell us about your stair fall tied to a chair? Mm -hmm. Wearing a mask. Wearing a mask. I'm assuming backwards. Mm -hmm. What was that experience like? She's tied to a wooden chair, hands, feet. And wearing her mask, a mask of her face, because they wanted to like believe it was her. So, and she had to go backwards down a metal graded stairway. This guy has like, captured her and shoves her down the stairway, backwards, tied to the wooden chair. And the chair was somewhat breakaway. It was a, a, ba a balsa wood chair, but it didn't really break away. <laughs> and so I just sort of like, I was working nights on that and then I went over to because that's the way the industry worked is you had to like try to facilitate all shows and be everywhere and so yeah tied to the chair and I just kind of like went all right let's see what happens I'm just gonna go for it and that's the thing that I used to do is I would just get mad when I was doing the stunt because if you didn't attack the car that was in you or attack the stairs or attack whatever it was you're gonna get hurt so I would attack whatever it was first yeah, yeah, and just yeah. get mad and get that adrenaline like I'm going to kill the yeah. stairs and this chair and JJ if I <laughs> survive this. And so I went went down and the chair kind of broke apart sort of in like a ass over tea kettle and like smashed my face on the stairs and like in a heap. And that would have been fine but we did seven takes. Did you do that seven times? And yeah, so they kept and the angles weren't changing. It was the same camera angle. So after take six I turned to the director and the camera operators and I said well I'm not doing anything different are any of you gonna do anything different like perhaps move the camera and like I'm just a stunt double here I was completely out of line but I was pissed yeah. I was done yeah and so I go you got one more and I'm done because I'd already smashed my face and sprained my ankle and I knew yeah. I had to work that night on so and it was just like a yard sale. It was just, it hurt. And I couldn't see and I couldn't breathe and it was hot in the mask. And I did one more and they were like, got it. And I'm like, no shit. We're always living in fear as a stunt performer of disappointing or pissing someone off or I said the wrong thing or I shouldn't talk or sorry. 
It's Canadian, sorry. Yeah. I'm just so happy to be here. Thank you. And I was at a point in my career where I had the confidence because I had stunt coordinated and I knew they had the shot because I watched playback. Yeah. And I saw the angles and I knew they had the shot. Yeah. If I didn't think they had a shot, I would have kept doing it. Yeah. And that's a, a place that you get to where when you're trying to prove yourself, you don't want to do anything to piss anybody off or say anything. Yeah. It takes years of knowledge and a belief in yourself that, you know, knowing the angles, knowing the situation and just go, hmm, is there a better way we could approach this? Yeah. Like, how about let's move the camera angle and get something different or let's stop doing this. With your extensive experience, what advice would you give aspiring stunt performers who are just starting their journey in the world of stunt and action coordination? Something I always say to young people is learn to fight. Learn to fight. It's all about martial arts and superheroes. So fighting seems to be about 75% of, of action. And if you want to be a wheelman, do driving and that kind of thing, start racing motorcycles because it teaches you about weight transference and braking and all those things. Um, but the more you can learn, the more skills you have, A, you're learning how to learn. So you're, you're going to be able to learn quicker a new skill. Be humble. Um, take care of your body, you know, because it's a, it's a marathon. This is a marathon and you got to take care of your body. I've always tried to stay in shape, yoga, training, although I hate yoga, I hate stretching. Martial arts and fights seem to be a major part of our world, but don't just do martial arts and fights or film or film blue. Learn other things so that you can be a valuable asset. It's like if I'm going to take five people to a movie in Thailand, I need multi-purpose tools. Yeah. Learn to rig, learn to do fight choreographer, drive a car, learn how to fix things. So you need to be a valuable Swiss army knife. We also have to be filmmakers now. We know how to, we have to be able to shoot yeah. and edit. So learn how to edit. That was something I learned early on that I had to focus on editing and how to shoot and how to direct so that you're more of an asset that you bring to the table. The more you know, the more you can do, the more of an asset you are. That's what I would do. What do you think seven-year-old Melissa Stubbs would say to present Melissa Stubbs after the incredible career you've had? Stop being so serious about stuff and have fun. It's fun. Seven-year-old Melissa Stubbs, I hope, would tell me that now. And enjoy the ride.